Blackstone Audio Books presents The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades by Robert Spencer. Introduction Islam and the Crusades The Crusades may be causing more devastation today than they ever did in the three centuries when most of them were fought. Not in terms of lives lost and property destroyed. Today's is a more subtle destruction. The Crusades have become a cardinal sin, not only of the Catholic Church, but also of the Western world in general. They are Exhibit A for the case that the current strife between the Muslim world and Western post-Christian civilization is ultimately the responsibility of the West, which has provoked, exploited, and brutalized Muslims ever since the first Frankish warriors entered Jerusalem and... Well, let Bill Clinton tell it. Indeed, in the First Crusade, when the Christian soldiers took Jerusalem, they first burned a synagogue with three hundred Jews in it, and proceeded to kill every woman and child who was Muslim on the Temple Mound. The contemporaneous descriptions of the event describe soldiers walking on the Temple Mound, a holy place to Christians, with blood running up to their knees. I can tell you that that story is still being told today in the Middle East, and we are still paying for it. In this analysis, Clinton curiously echoed Osama bin Laden himself, some of whose own communiques spoke of his organization not as al-Qaeda, but of a world Islamic front for jihad against Jews and crusaders, and called in a fatwa for jihad against Jews and crusaders. Such usage is quite widespread. Shortly before the beginning of the Iraqi war that toppled Saddam Hussein, on November 8, 2002, Sheikh Bakr Abed al-Razak al-Samarai preached in Baghdad's Mother of All Battles mosque about this difficult hour in which the Islamic nation is experiencing, an hour in which it faces the challenge of forces of disbelief of infidels, Jews, crusaders, Americans, and Britons. Similarly, when Islamic jihadists bombed the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in December 2004, they explained that the attack was part of a larger plan to strike back at crusaders. This operation comes as part of several operations that are organized and planned by al-Qaeda as part of the battle against the crusaders and the Jews, as well as part of the plan to force the unbelievers to leave the Arabian Peninsula. They said that jihad warriors managed to enter one of the crusaders' big castles in the Arabian Peninsula and managed to enter the American consulate in Jeddah, in which they control and run the country. One of the crusaders' big castles in the Arabian Peninsula? Why would Islamic jihad terrorists have such a fixation with thousand-year-old castles? Could Clinton be right that they see the Crusades as the time that their troubles with the West began, and present-day conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan as a revival of the Crusader ethos? In a sense, yes. The more one understands the Crusades, why they were fought, and from what forces within Christianity and Islam they sprang, the more one will understand the present conflict. The Crusades, in ways that Bill Clinton and those who bombed the consulate in Jeddah only dimly fathom, hold the keys to understanding the present world situation in numerous ways. This book explains why, with its first half devoted to Islam and second half to the Crusades. It will, in the process, clear away some of the fog of misinformation that surrounds Islam and the Crusades today. That fog is thicker than ever. One of the people most responsible for it, Western apologist for Islam Karen Armstrong, even blames Westerners' misperceptions of Islam on the Crusades. Ever since the Crusades, the people of Western Christendom developed a stereotypical and distorted vision of Islam, which they regarded as the enemy of decent civilization. 
It was, for example, during the Crusades, when it was Christians who had instigated a series of brutal holy wars against the Muslim world, that Islam was described by the learned scholar monks of Europe as an inherently violent and intolerant faith, which had only been able to establish itself by the sword. The myth of the supposed fanatical intolerance of Islam has become one of the received ideas of the West. Armstrong is right in a sense. No human being, it seems, can be wrong all the time. When it comes to talk of Islam, you can't believe everything you hear, especially after the September 11th attacks. Misinformation and half-truths about what Islam teaches and what Muslims in the United States believe have filled the airwaves and have even influenced public policy. Much of this misapprehension comes in analyses of the root causes of the jihad terrorism that took so many lives on September 11th, and has continued to threaten the peace and stability of non-Muslims around the world. It has become fashionable among certain media people and academics to place much, if not all, of the blame for what happened on September 11, 2001, not on Islam and Muslims, but on the United States and other Western countries. A pattern of mistreatment of the Islamic world by the West, say learned professors and self-important commentators, is continuing. It began centuries ago, they say at the time of the Crusades. But in fact, the seeds of today's conflict were planted much earlier than the First Crusade. In order to understand the Crusades properly, and the peculiar resonance they have in today's global conflict with Islamic Jihad terrorists, we must begin with a survey of the Prophet of Arabia and the religion he founded. For the Crusades, as we shall see, were fundamentally a reaction to events that were set in motion over 450 years before the battles began. I intend this book to be neither a general introduction to the Islamic religion, nor a comprehensive historical survey of the Crusades. Rather, it is an examination of certain highly tendentious assertions about both Islam and the Crusades that have entered the popular discourse. This book is an attempt to move the public discourse about both subjects a bit closer to the truth. Part 1. Islam Chapter 1. Muhammad, Prophet of War Guess what? Muhammad did not teach peace and tolerance. Muhammad led armies and ordered assassinations of his enemies. Islamic tradition allows for negotiated settlements only in service of the ultimate goal of Islamic conquest. Why does the life of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, matter today? Fourteen centuries have passed since he was born. Millions of Muslims have lived and died since then, and many leaders have risen to lead the faithful, including descendants of the prophet himself. Surely Islam, like other religions, has changed over 1,400 years. Here's why the life of Muhammad matters. Contrary to what many secularists would have us believe, religions are not entirely determined or distorted by the faithful over time. The lives and words of the founders remain central, no matter how long ago they lived. The idea that believers shape religion is derived instead from the fashionable 1960s philosophy of deconstructionism, which teaches that written words have no meaning other than that given to them by the reader. Equally important, it follows that if the reader alone finds meaning, there can be no truth, and certainly no religious truth. One person's meaning is equal to another's. Ultimately, according to deconstructionism, we all create our own set of truths, none better or worse than any other. Yet for the religious man or woman on the streets of Chicago, Rome, Jerusalem, Damascus, Calcutta, and Bangkok, the words of Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, Krishna, and Buddha mean something far greater than any individual's reading of them. And even to the less than devout reader, the words of these great religious teachers are clearly not equal in their meaning. 
That's why I have placed a Muhammad versus Jesus sidebar in every chapter to emphasize the fallacy of those who claim that Islam and Christianity, and all other religious traditions for that matter, are basically equal in their ability to inspire good or evil. It is also meant to emphasize that the West, built on Christianity, is worth defending, even if we live in a so-called post-Christian era. Furthermore, through the words of Muhammad and Jesus, we can draw a distinction between the core principles that guide the faithful Muslim and Christian. These principles are important. The followers of Muhammad read his words and imitate his actions, which leads to an expression of faith quite different from Christians. One does not have to look too far to see that life in an Islamic country is different from life in the United States or Britain. The difference begins with Muhammad. In these days, when so many invoke Muhammad's words and deeds to justify actions of violence and bloodshed, it is important to become familiar with this pivotal figure. For many in the West, Muhammad remains more mysterious than other major religious figures. Most people know, for example, that Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, that Jesus died on a cross at Calvary and was raised from the dead, and maybe even that Buddha sat under a tree and received enlightenment. But less is known about Muhammad, and even that much is disputed. Hence, what follows will be taken solely from Islamic texts. First basic fact. Muhammad ibn Abdallah ibn Abd al-Muttalib, 570-632, the prophet of Islam, was a man of war. He taught his followers to fight for his new religion. He said that their god, Allah, had commanded them to take up arms. And Muhammad, no armchair general, fought in numerous battles. These facts are crucial to anyone who really wants to understand what caused the Crusades centuries ago, or in our own time, what has led to the rise of the global jihad movement. In the course of these battles, Muhammad articulated numerous principles that have been followed by Muslims to this day. Therefore, it is important to record some features of Muhammad's battles, which can provide insight into today's newspaper headlines, insights that continue, sadly, to elude many analysts and experts. Muhammad the Raider Muhammad already had experience as a warrior before he assumed the role of prophet. He had participated in two local wars between his Quraysh tribe and their neighboring rivals, Banu Hawazin. But his unique role as prophet warrior would come later. After receiving revelations from Allah through the angel Gabriel in 610, he began by just preaching to his tribe the worship of one God and his own position as a prophet. But he was not well received by his Quraysh brethren in Mecca, who reacted disdainfully to his prophetic call and refused to give up their gods. Muhammad's frustration and rage became evident. When even his uncle, Abu Lahab, rejected his message, Muhammad cursed him and his wife in violent language that has been preserved in the Quran, the holy book of Islam. May the hands of Abu Lahab perish, may he himself perish. Nothing shall his wealth and gains avail him. He shall be burnt in a flaming fire, and his wife, laden with faggots, shall have a rope of fiber around her neck. Quran Surah 111, verses 1 through 5. Ultimately, Muhammad would turn from violent words to violent deeds. In 622, he finally fled his native Mecca for a nearby town, Medina, where a band of tribal warriors had accepted him as a prophet and pledged loyalty to him. In Medina, these new Muslims began raiding the caravans of the Quraysh, with Muhammad personally leading many of these raids. These raids kept the nascent Muslim movement solvent and helped form Islamic theology, as in one notorious incident when a band of Muslims raided a Quraysh caravan at Nakla, a settlement not far from Mecca. The raiders attacked the caravan during the sacred month of Rajab, 
when fighting was forbidden. When they returned to the Muslim camp laden with booty, Muhammad refused to share in the loot or to have anything to do with them, saying only, I did not order you to fight in the sacred month. But then a new revelation came from Allah, explaining that the Quraysh's opposition to Muhammad was a worse transgression than the violation of the sacred month. In other words, the raid was justified. They questioned thee, O Muhammad, with regard to warfare in the sacred month. Say, warfare therein is a great transgression, but to turn men from the way of Allah, and to disbelieve in him and in the inviolable place of worship, and to expel his people thence, is a greater sin with Allah, for persecution is worse than killing. Quran, Surah 2, verse 214. Whatever sin the Nakla raiders had committed was overshadowed by the Quraysh's rejection of Muhammad. This was a momentous revelation, for it led to an Islamic principle that has had repercussions throughout the ages. Good became identified with anything that redounded to the benefit of Muslims, regardless of whether it violated moral or other laws. The moral absolutes enshrined in the Ten Commandments and other teachings of the great religions that preceded Islam were swept aside in favor of an overarching principle of expediency. Just like today, killing non-combatants. When Osama bin Laden killed innocent non-combatants in the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, and later his co-religionists captured and beheaded civilian hostages in Iraq, American Muslim spokesmen blandly asserted that this targeting of innocent people was forbidden by Islam. This was debatable, since some Islamic legal authorities allow the killing of non-combatants if they are seen as aiding the enemies of Islam in war. However, even if the principle were correct, it would give way to another that arose out of the Nakla raid. Persecution is worse than killing, and therefore to fight against the persecution of Muslims by any means necessary is the highest good. The Battle of Badr Soon after Nakla came the first major battle the Muslims fought. Muhammad heard that a large Quraysh caravan, laden with money and goods, was coming from Syria. This is the Quraysh caravan containing their property, he told his followers. Go out to attack it. Perhaps God will give it as a prey. He set out toward Mecca to lead the raid. But this time the Quraysh were ready for him, coming out to meet Muhammad's three hundred men with a force nearly a thousand strong. Muhammad seems not to have expected these numbers, and cried out to Allah in anxiety, O God, if this band perish today, thou wilt be worshipped no more. Despite their superior numbers, the Quraysh were routed. Some Muslim traditions say that Muhammad himself participated in the fighting, others that he exhorted his followers from the sidelines. In any event, it was an occasion for him to see years of frustration, resentment, and hatred toward his own people, who had rejected him, avenged. One of his followers later recalled a curse Muhammad had pronounced on the leaders of the Quraysh. The Prophet said, O Allah, destroy the chiefs of Quraysh, O Allah, destroy Abu Jal bin Hisham, Utbah bin Rabia, Shaiba bin Rabia. Ukba bin Abi Mu'ayt, Umayya bin Khalaf, or Ubay bin Khalaf. All these men were captured or killed during the Battle of Badr. One Quraysh leader, named in this curse, Ukba, pleaded for his life. But who will look after my children, O Muhammad? Hell, responded the Prophet of Islam, and ordered Ukba killed. Another Quraysh chieftain, Abu Jal, which means father of ignorance, a name given him by Muslim chroniclers, his real name was Amr ibn Hisham, was beheaded. The Muslim who severed the head proudly carried his trophy to Muhammad. I cut off his head and brought it to the apostle, saying, This is the head of the enemy of God, Abu Jal. 
Muhammad was delighted. By God, than whom there is no other, is it? he exclaimed, and gave thanks to Allah for the death of his enemy. The bodies of all those named in the curse were thrown into a pit. As an eyewitness recalled, later on I saw all of them killed during the battle of Badr, and their bodies were thrown into a well, except the body of Umea or Ubai, because he was a fat man, and when he was pulled, the parts of his body got separated before he was thrown into the well. Then Muhammad taunted them as people of the pit, and posed a theological question. Have you found what God promised you is true? I have found that what my Lord promised me is true. When asked why he was speaking to dead bodies, he replied, You cannot hear what I say better than they, but they cannot answer me. The victory at Badr was the legendary turning point for the Muslims. Muhammad even claimed that armies of angels joined with the Muslims to smite the Quraysh and that similar help would come in the future to Muslims who remained faithful to Allah. Allah had helped you at Badr, when ye were a contemptible little force. Then fear Allah, thus may you show your gratitude. Remember thou saidst to the faithful, Is it not enough for you that Allah should help you with three thousand angels specially sent down? Yea, if ye remain firm and act aright, even if the enemy should rush here on you in hot haste, your Lord would help you with five thousand angels making a terrific onslaught. Quran, Surah 3, verses 123 through 125. Another revelation from Allah emphasized that it was piety, not military might, that brought victory at Badr. There has already been for you a sign in the two armies that met in combat. One was fighting in the cause of Allah, the other resisting Allah. These saw with their own eyes twice their number. But Allah doth support with his aid whom he pleaseth. In this is a warning for such as have eyes to see. Quran, Surah 3, verse 13. Another Quranic passage asserts that the Muslims were merely passive instruments at Badr. It is not ye who slew them, it was Allah. Quran, Surah 8, verse 17. And Allah would grant such victories to pious Muslims, even though they faced odds even more overwhelming than those they had overcome at Badr. O Prophet, rouse the believers to the fight. If there are twenty amongst you, patient and persevering, they will vanquish two hundred. If a hundred, they will vanquish a thousand of the unbelievers. For these are a people without understanding. Quran, Surah 8, verse 65. Allah rewarded those he had granted victory at Badr. There was a great booty, so much, in fact, that it became a bone of contention. So divisive did this become that Allah himself spoke about it in a chapter, Surah, of the Quran, devoted entirely to reflections on the battle of Badr. The eighth chapter, titled Al-Anfal, the spoils of war, or booty. Allah warns the Muslims not to consider booty won at Badr to belong to anyone but Muhammad. They ask thee concerning things taken as spoils of war. Say, such spoils are at the disposal of Allah and the Messenger, so fear Allah and keep straight the relations between yourselves. Obey Allah and his Messenger, if ye do believe. Quran, Surah 8, Verse 1. Ultimately, Muhammad distributed the booty among the Muslims equally, keeping a fifth for himself. And know that whatever ye take as spoils of war, lo, a fifth thereof is for Allah, and for the messenger, and for the kinsman, who hath need, and orphans, and the needy, and the wayfarer. If ye believe in Allah, and that which we revealed unto our slave on the day of discrimination, the day when the two armies met. Quran, Surah 8, verse 41. Allah emphasized that it was a reward for obedience to him. Now enjoy what ye have won, as lawful and good, and keep your duty to Allah. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. Quran, Surah 8, verse 69. 
From being a tiny despised community, the Muslims were now a force with which the pagans of Arabia had to reckon, and they began to strike terror in the hearts of their enemies. Muhammad's claim to be the last prophet of the one true God appeared validated by a victory against enormous odds. With this victory, certain attitudes and assumptions were being planted in the minds of Muslims, which remain with many of them to this day. These include, Allah will grant victory to his people against foes that are superior in numbers or firepower, so long as they remain faithful to his commands. Victories entitle the Muslims to appropriate the possessions of the vanquished as booty. Bloody vengeance against one's enemies belongs not solely to the Lord, but also to those who submit to him on earth. That is the meaning of the word Islam, submission. Prisoners taken in battle against the Muslims may be put to death at the discretion of Muslim leaders. Those who reject Islam are the vilest of creatures. Quran, Surah 98, verse 6 and thus deserve no mercy. Anyone who insults or even opposes Muhammad or his people deserves a humiliating death, by beheading if possible. This is in accordance with Allah's command to smite the necks of the unbelievers. Quran, Surah 47, verse 4. Above all, the Battle of Badr was the first practical example of what came to be known as the Islamic doctrine of jihad, a doctrine that holds the key to the understanding of both the Crusades and the conflicts of today. Assassination and Deceit Flushed with victory, Muhammad stepped up his raiding operations. He also hardened in his attitudes toward the Jewish tribes of the region, who kept their faith and rejected Muhammad as a prophet of God. With this rejection, Muhammad's prophetic calls to Jews began to get violent, emphasizing earthly punishment. Striding into the center of the marketplace of the Banu Kainuga, a Jewish tribe with whom he had a truce, he announced to the crowds, O Jews, beware lest God bring upon you the vengeance that he brought upon Quraysh, and become Muslims. You know that I am a prophet who has been sent. You will find that in your scriptures and God's covenant with you. The Jews of the Banu Kainuga were not persuaded, frustrating the prophet even more. He laid siege on them until they offered him unconditional surrender. Even then, Muhammad's anger was not assuaged. He found a new focus for it in a Jewish poet, Kab bin al-Ashraf, who, according to Muhammad's first biographer, Ibn Ishaq, composed amatory verses of an insulting nature about the Muslim women. Muhammad asked his followers, Who is willing to kill Kab bin al-Ashraf, who has hurt Allah and his apostle? He found a volunteer in a young Muslim named Muhammad bin Maslama. O Allah's apostle, would you like that I kill him? After the prophet answered, Yes, Muhammad bin Maslama asked him for permission to lie in order to deceive Kab bin al-Ashraf into walking into an ambush. The prophet granted him this permission, and Muhammad bin Maslama duly deceived and murdered Kab. After the murder of Kab, Muhammad issued a blanket command. Kill any Jew that falls into your power. This was not a military order. The first victim was a Jewish merchant, Ibn Sunayna, who had social and business relations with the Muslims. The murderer, Muhayisa, was rebuked for the deed by his brother, Huayisa, who was not yet a Muslim. Muhayisa was unrepentant. He told his brother, Had the one who ordered me to kill him ordered me to kill you, I would have cut your head off. Huwaisa was impressed. By God, a religion which can bring you to this is marvelous. He became a Muslim. The world is still witnessing such marvels to this day. Ibn Warak on Islam the theory and practice of jihad was not concocted in the Pentagon. It was taken from the Koran, the Hadith, and Islamic tradition. Western liberals, especially humanists, find it hard to believe this. 
It is extraordinary the amount of people who have written about the 11th of September without once mentioning Islam. We must take seriously what the Islamists say to understand their motivation, that it is the divinely ordained duty of all Muslims to fight in the literal sense until man-made law has been replaced by God's law, the Sharia, and Islamic law has conquered the entire world. For every text the liberal Muslims produce, the mullahs will use dozens of counterexamples that are exegetically, philosophically, historically far more legitimate. Muhammad versus Jesus Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies, of Allah, and your enemies, and others besides, whom ye may not know, but whom Allah doth know. Quran, Surah 8, verse 60 Revenge and Pretexts After their humiliation at Badr, the Quraysh were anxious for revenge. They assembled three thousand troops against one thousand Muslims at Uhud. Muhammad wore two coats of mail, and brandishing a sword, led the Muslims into battle. But this time they were routed. The Prophet himself had his face bloodied and a tooth knocked out. Rumors even flew around the battlefield that he had been killed. When he was able to find water to wash the blood off his face, Muhammad vowed revenge. The wrath of God is fierce against him who bloodied the face of his prophet. When Abu Sufyan, the Quraysh leader, taunted the Muslims, Muhammad was adamant, and emphasized the traditional sharp Islamic distinction between believers and unbelievers. He told his lieutenant, Umar, to respond, God is most high and most glorious. We are not equal. Our dead are in paradise. Your dead in hell. Muhammad vowed revenge again when he found the body of his uncle Hamza. Hamza had been killed at Uhud, and his body horribly mutilated by a woman, Hind bint Utba, who cut off Hamza's nose and ears and ate a part of his liver. She did this in revenge for the killing of her father, brother, uncle, and eldest son at Badr. The prophet was not in the least moved by the fact that she had done these terrible deeds in revenge. If God gives me victory over Quraysh in the future, he exclaimed, I will mutilate thirty of their men. Touched by his grief and anger, his followers made a similar vow. By God, if God gives us victory over them in the future, we will mutilate them as no Arab has ever mutilated anyone. Just like today, Pretexts Another pattern was set at Uhud that played out across the centuries. Muslims would see any aggression as a pretext for revenge, regardless of whether they provoked it. With a canny understanding of how to sway public opinion, jihadists and their PC allies on the American left today use current events as pretexts to justify what they are doing. Time and again they portray themselves as merely reacting to grievous provocations from the enemies of Islam. By this they gain recruits and sway popular opinion. Conventional wisdom among a surprisingly broad political spectrum today holds that the global jihad movement is a response to some provocation or other, the invasion of Iraq, the establishment of Israel, the toppling of Iran's Mossadegh, or a more generalized offense such as American neo-colonialism or the lust for oil. Those who are particularly forgetful of history blame it on newly minted epiphenomena such as the Abu Ghraib prison scandals, which cast a shadow over America's presence in Iraq in 2004. But the jihadists were fighting long before Abu Ghraib, Iraq, Israel, or American independence, Indeed, they have been fighting and imitating their warrior prophet ever since the seventh century, casting their actions as responses to the enormities of their enemies ever since Muhammad discovered his uncle's mutilated body. 
In Victory and Defeat, More Islam Defeat at Uhud, meanwhile, did nothing to shake Muslims' faith or dull its fervor. Allah told them they would have gained another victory if they had not disobeyed him. Allah verily made good his promise unto you when ye routed them by his leave, until the moment when your courage failed you, and ye disagreed about the order, and ye disobeyed, after he had shown you that for which ye long. Quran, Surah 3, verse 152. Here again a pattern was set. When things go wrong for the Muslims, it is punishment for not being faithful to Islam. In 1948, Sayyid Qutb, the great theorist of the Muslim Brotherhood, which holds the distinction of being the first modern Islamic terrorist group, declared of the Islamic world, We only have to look in order to see that our social situation is as bad as it can be. Yet we continually cast aside all our own spiritual heritage, all our intellectual endowment, and all the solutions which might well be revealed by a glance at these things. We cast aside our own fundamental principles and doctrines, and we bring in those of democracy, or socialism, or communism. In other words, Islam alone guarantees success, and to abandon it brings failure. The theological connection between victory and obedience and defeat and disobedience was reinforced after the Muslim victory at the Battle of the Trench in 627. Muhammad again received a revelation that attributed the victory to Allah's supernatural intervention. O ye who believe, remember Allah's favor unto you, when there came against you hosts, and we sent against them a great wind, and hosts ye could not see. Quran, Surah 33, verse 9. Just like today, tsunami calls for more Islam. After a tsunami devastated the South Pacific on December 26, 2004, Australia and the United States alone pledged more than $1 billion in aid. Oil-soaked Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Algeria, Bahrain, and Libya, made a combined pledge of less than one-tenth this amount. One reason for this? Islamic teachers attributed the tsunami to the sins committed by infidels and Muslims in heavily Islamic Indonesia. As one Saudi cleric said, it happened at Christmas when fornicators and corrupt people from all over the world come to commit fornication and sexual perversion. PC Myth We Can Negotiate With These People Yet another key Islamic principle was formulated by events surrounding the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. In 628, Muhammad had a vision in which he performed a pilgrimage to Mecca, a pagan custom that he wanted to make part of Islam, but had so far been unable to do so because of Quraysh control of the city. He directed Muslims to prepare to make the pilgrimage to Mecca, and advanced on the city with fifteen hundred men. The Quraysh met him outside the city, and the two sides concluded a ten-year truce, Hudna, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Muslims agreed to return home without making the pilgrimage, and the Quraysh would allow them to make the pilgrimage the following year. Muhammad shocked his men by agreeing further to provisions that seemed highly disadvantageous to the Muslims. Those fleeing the Quraysh and seeking refuge with the Muslims would be returned to the Quraysh, while those fleeing the Muslims and seeking refuge with the Quraysh would not be returned to the Muslims. The Quraysh negotiator, Suhail bin Amr, even compelled Muhammad not to identify himself as Muhammad, the Apostle of God. Said Suhail, If I witnessed that you were God's Apostle, I would not have fought you. Write your own name and the name of your father. To the dismay of his companions, Muhammad did so. Then, contrary to all appearances, he insisted that the Muslims had been victorious, producing a new revelation from Allah. Verily we have granted thee a manifest victory. Quran, 
Surah 48, verse 1. He promised that his followers would reap much booty. Allah was well pleased with the believers when they swore allegiance unto thee beneath the tree, and he knew what was in their hearts, and he sent down peace of reassurance on them, and half rewarded them with a near victory, and much booty that they will capture. Allah is ever mighty, wise. Allah promiseth you much booty that ye will capture, and hath given you this in advance, and hath withheld men's hands from you, that it may be a token for the believers, and that he may guide you on a right path. Quran, Surah 48, verses 18 through 20. If any of his followers were still skeptical, their fears would soon be assuaged. A woman of the Quraysh, Um Kultum, joined the Muslims in Medina. Her two brothers came to Muhammad asking that she be returned, in accordance with the agreement between him and the Quraysh at Hudaybiyah. Muhammad refused because Allah forbade it. He gave Muhammad a new revelation. O ye who believe, when there come to you believing women refugees, examine and test them. Allah knows best as to their faith. If ye ascertain that they are believers, then send them not back to the unbelievers. Quran, Surah 60, verse 10. In refusing to send Umm Kultum back to the Quraysh, Muhammad broke the treaty. Although Muslim apologists have claimed throughout history that the Quraysh broke it first, this incident came before any treaty violations by the Quraysh. Furthermore, breaking the treaty reinforced the principle that nothing was good except what was advantageous to Islam, and nothing evil except what hindered it. Once the treaty was formally discarded, Islamic jurists enunciated the principle that, in general, truces were to be concluded for no longer than ten years, and only entered into for the purpose of allowing weakened Muslim forces to gain strength. Subsequent events would illustrate the dark implications of this principle. A Book You Are Not Supposed to Read A. Guillaume, The Life of Muhammad a translation of Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasul Allah, Oxford University Press, 1955. An English translation of the earliest biography of Muhammad, written by a pious Muslim. Virtually every page presents a devastating refutation of the whitewashed, peaceful Muhammad of PC myth. Chapter 2 The Quran Book of War. Guess what? The Quran commands Muslims to make war on Jews and Christians. Oft quoted tolerant, peaceful Quranic verses have actually been cancelled according to Islamic theology. There is nothing in the Bible that rivals the Quran's exhortations to violence. With Muhammad's prophetic career so thoroughly marked by blood and warfare, it should be no surprise that the sacred book bequeathed by the Prophet of Islam to the world, the Quran, would be similarly violent and intransigent. And it's true. The Quran is unique among the sacred writings of the world in counseling its adherents to make war against unbelievers. The Quran counsels war. There are over a hundred verses in the Quran that exhort believers to wage jihad against unbelievers. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be firm against them. Their abode is hell, an evil refuge indeed. Quran, Surah 9, verse 73. Strive hard in Arabic is jahidi, a verbal form of the noun jihad. This striving was to be on the battlefield. When you meet the unbelievers in the battlefield, strike off their heads, and when you have laid them low, bind your captives firmly. Quran, Surah 47, verse 4. This is emphasized repeatedly. O ye who believe, fight the unbelievers who gird you about, and let them find firmness in you, and know that Allah is with those who fear him. 
Quran, Surah 9, verse 123. This warfare was to be directed against both those who rejected Islam and those who professed to be Muslims but did not hold to the fullness of the faith. Prophet, make war on the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and deal rigorously with them. Hell shall be their home, an evil fate. Quran, Surah 9, verse 73. This warfare was only part of the larger spiritual conflict between Allah and Satan. Those who believe fight in the cause of Allah, and those who reject faith fight in the cause of evil. So fight ye against the friends of Satan. Quran, Surah 4, verse 76. Then, when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever ye find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. Quran, Surah 9, verse 5. The poor due in this verse is zakat, which is one of the five pillars of Islam, and regulates religious tithes. Thus the verse is saying that if the idolaters become Muslims, leave them alone. Jews and Christians were to be fought, along with idolaters. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Quran, Surah 9, verse 29. The jizya was a tax inflicted upon non-believers. Jihad is the highest duty of Muslims. Do ye make the giving of drink to pilgrims, or the maintenance of the sacred mosque, equal to the pious service of those who believe in Allah and the last day, and strive with might and main in the cause of Allah? Jihad fi sabil Allah? They are not comparable in the sight of Allah, and Allah guides not those who do wrong. Those who believe and suffer exile and strive with might and main in Allah's cause, jihad fi sabil Allah, with their goods and their persons, have the highest rank in the sight of Allah. They are the people who will achieve salvation. Quran, Surah 9, verses 19 and 20. In Islamic theology, jihad fi sabil Allah refers specifically to taking up arms for Islam. Paradise is guaranteed to those who slay and are slain for Allah. Allah hath purchased of the believers their persons and their goods, for theirs in return is the garden of paradise. They fight in his cause and slay and are slain a promise binding on him in truth. Quran, Surah 9, verse 111 One may attempt to spiritualize such verses, but there is no doubt from the historical record that Muhammad meant them literally. PC Myth The Quran teaches tolerance and peace. But wait a minute. Doesn't the Quran really teach tolerance and peace? Sure, there are a few bad verses here and there, but there are also a lot of verses that affirm the brotherhood of man and the equality and dignity of all people, right? No. The closest the Koran comes actually to counseling tolerance or peaceful coexistence is to counsel believers to leave the unbelievers alone in their errors. Say, O oh, disbelievers, I worship not that which ye worship nor worship ye that which I worship, and I shall not worship that which ye worship, nor will ye worship that which I worship. Unto you your religion, and unto me my religion. Quran, Surah 109, verses 1 through 6. Of course they are to be left alone so that Allah can deal with them. And have patience with what they say, and leave them with noble dignity and leave me alone to deal with those in possession of the good things of life who yet deny the truth, and bear with them for a little while. 
Quran, Surah 73, verses 10 and 11. Above all, no Muslim should force anyone to accept Islam. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in Allah hath grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks. Quran, Surah 2, verse 256. But is this really tolerance the way that modern Westerners understand it? It might be a reasonable facsimile if that were all the Quran has to say about the subject, but it isn't. PC Myth The Quran teaches believers to take up arms only in self-defense. At this point, Islamic apologists might grant that the Quran doesn't leave relations between believers and unbelievers at the live and let live stage. They may admit that it counsels believers to defend themselves, and will argue that it is somewhat akin to the Catholic Church's just war theory. There is support for this view in the Quran. Fight in the way of Allah against those who fight against you, but begin not hostilities. Lo, Allah loveth not aggressors. So Muslims are, in this verse at least, not to start conflicts with unbelievers. Once hostilities have begun, however, Muslims should wage them furiously. And slay them wherever ye find them, and drive them out of the places whence they drove you out, for persecution is worse than slaughter. And fight not with them at the inviolable place of worship until they first attack you there. But if they attack you there, then slay them. Such is the reward of disbelievers. But if they desist, then lo! Allah is forgiving, merciful. And what is to be the conclusion of this war? And fight them until persecution is no more, and religion is for Allah. Quran, Surah 2, verses 190 through 193. This would seem to indicate that the war must continue until the world is Islam, the religion is for Allah, or under the hegemony of Islamic law. Consequently, there is a problem with the interpretation that jihad warfare can only be defensive. The South African mufti, Ibrahim Desai, repeated a common teaching in Islam when he answered a question at Islam Q&A online. The questioner asked, I have a question about offensive jihad. Does it mean that we are to attack even those non-Muslims which don't sick do anything against Islam just because we have to propagate Islam? Desai responded, You should understand that we as Muslims firmly believe that the person who doesn't believe in Allah as he is required to is a disbeliever who would be doomed to hell eternally. Thus, one of the primary responsibilities of the Muslim ruler is to spread Islam throughout the world, thus saving people from eternal damnation. Thus, what is meant by the passage in Tafsir Uthmani, a commentary on the Quran, is that if a country doesn't allow the propagation of Islam to its inhabitants in a suitable manner, or creates hindrances to this, then the Muslim ruler would be justified in waging jihad against this country, so that the message of Islam can reach its inhabitants, thus saving them from the fire of Jahannam, hell. If the Kufar, unbelievers, allow us to spread Islam peacefully, then we would not wage jihad against them. In other words, if a country is perceived to be hindering the spread of Islam, Muslims are obliged to wage war against it. This would, of course, be a defensive conflict, since the hindrances came first. Here, then, is another illustration of how elastic and essentially meaningless the concept of fighting only in self-defense has become. What constitutes a sufficient provocation? Must the defending side wait until the enemy strikes the first military blow? These questions have no clear or definitive answers in Islamic law, making it possible for anyone to portray virtually any struggle as defensive without violating the strict canons of that law. But this also renders meaningless the oft-repeated claims that jihad warfare can only be defensive. 
Just like today, jihadists cite Muhammad's battles to prove jihad is not just defensive. In an article titled The True Meaning of Jihad, posted in 2003 at the website Kilafa.com, which is affiliated with the jihadist group Hizb-ut-Tahrir, one Sadiq Akbar cites the example of Muhammad against those who would argue that jihad is purely defensive. Moreover, some will say that jihad was only defensive. This is incorrect. A quick study of the life of the Prophet, Salalahu alaihi wa salam, shows us something different. The Battle of Mutah was instigated by the Muslims against the Romans. The Muslims were 3,000 faced against a Roman army of 200,000. The Battle of Hunain was inevitable shortly after the Muslims had conquered Makkah. The Battle of Tabuk was also instigated to finally destroy the Romans. We see from the Ijma consensus of Sahaba, the companions of Muhammad, that they too instigated jihad through Asham, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, and North Africa. Moreover, the status of martyr in Islam is of the highest, so how can it be that jihad is reduced to anything lower than that? The Quran's Tolerant Verses Cancelled What's more, the Quran's last word on jihad is not defensive, but offensive. The surahs of the Quran are not arranged chronologically, but according to length. However, Islamic theology divides the Quran into Meccan and Medinan surahs. The Meccan ones comes from the first segment of Muhammad's career as a prophet, when he simply called the Meccans to Islam. Later, after he had fled to Medina, his positions hardened. The Medinan surahs are less poetic and generally much longer than those from Mecca. They are also filled with matters of law and ritual and exhortations to jihad warfare against unbelievers. The relatively tolerant verses quoted above and others like them generally date from the Meccan period, while those with a more violent and intolerant edge are mostly from Medina. Why does this distinction matter? because of the Islamic doctrine of abrogation, nasq. This is the idea that Allah can change or cancel what he tells Muslims. None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Knowest thou not that Allah hath power over all things? Quran, Surah 2, verse 106. According to this idea, the violent verses of the ninth surah, including the verse of the sword, surah 9, verse 5, abrogate the peaceful verses, because they were revealed later in Muhammad's prophetic career. In fact, most Muslim authorities agree that the ninth surah was the very last section of the Quran to be revealed. In line with this, some Islamic theologians have asserted that the verse of the sword abrogates no fewer than 124 more peaceful and tolerant verses of the Quran. Tafsir al-Jalalain, a commentary on the Quran by the respected imams Jalal al-Din Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Mahali, 1389-1459, to and Jalal al-Din Abd al-Rahman, Ibn Abi Bakr al-Suyuti, 1445-1505, asserts that the ninth surah was sent down when security was removed by the sword. Another mainstream and respected Quran commentator, Ismail bin Amr bin Kathir al-Dimashki, 1301-1372, known popularly as Ibn Kathir, declares that Surah 9, verse 5, abrogated every agreement of peace between the prophet and any idolater, every treaty, and every term. No idolater had any more treaty or promise of safety ever since Surah Bara, the ninth surah, was revealed. Ibn Juzai died 1340, yet another Quran commentator whose works are still read in the Islamic world, agrees. The verse of the sword's purpose is abrogating every peace treaty in the Quran.
Ibn Kathir makes this clear in his commentary on another tolerance verse. And he, Muhammad, saith, O my Lord, lo, these are a folk who believe not. Then bear with them, O Muhammad, and say, Peace, but they will come to know. Quran, Surah 43, verses 88 and 89. Ibn Kathir explains, Sai Salam, peace, means do not respond to them in the same evil manner in which they address you, but try to soften their hearts and forgive them in word and deed. However, that is not the end of the passage. Ibn Kathir then takes up the last part, but they will come to know. This is a warning from Allah for them. His punishment, which cannot be warded off, struck them, and his religion and his word was supreme. Subsequently, jihad and striving were prescribed until the people entered the religion of Allah in crowds, and Islam spread throughout the East and the West. That work is not yet complete. All this means that warfare against unbelievers, until they either become Muslim or pay the jizya, the special tax on non-Muslims in Islamic law, with willing submission, Quran, Surah 9, verse 29, is the Quran's last word on jihad. Mainstream Islamic tradition has interpreted this as Allah's enduring marching orders to the human race. The Islamic Ummah, community, must exist in a state of perpetual war with the non-Muslim world, punctuated only by temporary truces. Some Islamic theologians today are attempting to construct alternative visions of Islam based on a different understanding of abrogation. However, such efforts have met with little interest and support among Muslims worldwide not least because they fly in the face of interpretations that have been mainstream for centuries. Alexis de Tocqueville on Islam I studied the Koran a great deal. I came away from that study with the conviction that by and large there have been few religions in the world as deadly to men as that of Muhammad. So far as I can see, it is the principal cause of the decadence so visible today in the Muslim world, and though less absurd than the polytheism of old, its social and political tendencies are, in my opinion, more to be feared, and I therefore regard it as a form of decadence rather than a form of progress in relation to paganism itself. PC Myth The Quran and the Bible are equally violent. All right, so the Quran teaches war, but so does the Bible, right? Islamic apologists and their non-Muslim allies frequently try to make a case for moral equivalence between Islam and Christianity. Muslims have been violent, so have Christians. Muslims are waging jihad, well, what about the Crusades? The Quran teaches warfare, well, I could cherry-pick violent verses out of the Bible. You can find that sort of thing in all religious traditions, we're told. None of them is more or less likely to incite its followers to violence, we're assured. But is all this really true? Some Islamic apologists and non-Muslim purveyors of moral equivalence claim to find even in the New Testament passages that exhort believers to violence. They most often point to two passages. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Luke chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. Of course, the fallacy here is that these are the words of a king in a parable, not Jesus' instructions to his followers. But such subtleties are often ignored in the modern communications age. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I am sent to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. If this passage were really calling for any literal violence, it would seem to be intrafamilial jihad. 
but to invoke it as the equivalent of the Quran's jihad passages, which number over a hundred, is absurd. Even the crusaders, at their most venal and grasping, didn't invoke passages like these. Also, given the completely peaceful message of Jesus, it is clear that he meant a sword in an allegorical and metaphorical way. To interpret this text literally is to misunderstand Jesus, who, unlike Muhammad, did not take part in battles. It fails to recognize the poetry of the Bible, which is everywhere. Perhaps aware of how absurd such New Testament arguments are, Islamic apologists more often tend to focus on several Old Testament passages. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you, and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no favor to them. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. However, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the children and the animals and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as booty for yourself." and you shall use the spoil of your enemies which the Lord your God has given you. Only in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 10 through 17 Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman who has known man intimately. But all the girls who have not known man intimately, spare for yourselves. Numbers, chapter 31, verses 17 and 18. Strong stuff, right? Just as bad as slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. Quran, surah 9, verse 5. And therefore when ye meet the unbelievers in fight, smite at their necks. At length, when ye have thoroughly subdued them, bind a bond firmly on them. Quran, Surah 47, verse 4, and all the rest, right? Wrong. Unless you happen to be a Hittite, Girgashite, Amorite, Canaanite, Perizzite, Hivite, or Jebusite, these biblical passages simply do not apply to you. The Quran exhorts believers to fight unbelievers without specifying anywhere in the text that only certain unbelievers are to be fought, or only for a certain period of time, or some other distinction. Taking the texts at face value, the command to make war against unbelievers is open-ended and universal. The Old Testament, in contrast, records God's commands to the Israelites to make war against particular people only. This is jarring to modern sensibilities, to be sure, but it does not amount to the same thing. That's one reason why Jews and Christians haven't formed terror groups around the world that quote these scriptures to justify killing civilian non-combatants. By contrast, Osama bin Laden, who is only the most visible exponent of a terror network that extends from Indonesia to Nigeria and into Western Europe and the Americas, quotes the Koran copiously in his communiques. In his 1996 declaration of war against the Americans occupying the land of the two holy places, he quotes Surahs 3, verse 145, 47, verses 4 through 6, 2, verse 154, 9, verse 14, 47, verse 19, 8, verse 72, and, of course, the notorious verse of the sword, Surah 9, verse 5. In 2003, on the first day of the Muslim holy celebration, Eid al-Hadda, the Feast of Sacrifice, 
He began a sermon, Praise be to Allah, who revealed the verse of the sword to his servant and messenger, the prophet Muhammad, in order to establish truth and abolish falsehood. Of course, the devil can quote scripture for his own purpose, but Osama's use of these and other passages in his messages is consistent, as we shall see, with traditional Islamic understanding of the Quran. When modern-day Jews and Christians read their Bibles, they simply don't interpret the passages cited above as exhorting them to violent actions against unbelievers. This is due to the influence of centuries of interpretative traditions that have moved away from literalism regarding these passages. But in Islam, there is no comparable interpretative tradition. The jihad passages in the Quran are anything but a dead letter. In Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and elsewhere, a key recruiting ground for jihad terrorist groups is the Islamic school. The students learn that they must wage jihad warfare, and then these groups give them the opportunity. Just like today, the peaceful verses still abrogated. The doctrine of abrogation is not the province of long-dead muftis, whose works no longer carry any weight in the Islamic world. The Saudi Sheikh Muhammad Sali al-Munajid, born 1962, whose lectures and Islamic rulings, fatawa, circulate widely throughout the Islamic world, demonstrates this in a discussion of whether Muslims should force others to accept Islam. In considering Quran Surah 2, verse 256, there is no compulsion in religion. The Sheikh quotes Quran Surah 9, verse 29, Surah 8, verse 39, and fight them until there is no more fitna, disbelief and polytheism, that is, worshipping others besides Allah, and the religion, worship, will all be for Allah alone in the whole of the world and the verse of the sword. Of the latter, Sheikh Muhammad says simply, this verse is known as Ayat al-Saif, the verse of the sword. These and similar verses abrogate those saying that there is no compulsion to become Muslim. Muhammad versus Jesus If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Jesus, Matthew, Chapter 5, verse 39. Will ye not fight a folk who broke their solemn pledges and purposed to drive out the messenger and did attack you first? Quran, Surah 9, verse 13. Just like today, using the Quran to justify terrorism. In a sermon broadcast on official Palestinian Authority television in 2000, Dr. Ahmad Abu Halabia, a member of the Palestinian Authority's Fatwa Council, declared, Allah the Almighty has called upon us not to ally with the Jews or the Christians, not to like them, not to become their partners, not to support them, and not to sign agreements with them. And he who does that is one of them, as Allah said, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies, for they are allies of one another. Who from among you takes them as allies will indeed be one of them. Have no mercy on the Jews, no matter where they are in any country. Fight them wherever you are. Wherever you meet them, kill them. In this, Abu Halabia was quoting Quran Surah 5, verse 51. O ye who believe, take not the Jews and the Christians for your friends and protectors. They are but friends and protectors to each other. And he amongst you that turns to them for friendship is of them. And Surah 9, verse 5, Slay the idolaters wherever ye find them. He applied these words to the contemporary political situation. Wherever you are, kill those Jews and those Americans who are like them, and those who stand by them. They are all in one trench against the Arabs and the Muslims, because they established Israel here, in the beating heart of the Arab world, in Palestine. They created it to be the outpost of their civilization, and the vanguard of their army, and to be the sword of the West and the Crusaders, hanging over the necks of the monotheists the Muslims in these lands. 
a book you're not supposed to read. Don't believe what I am saying about the Koran. Read it for yourself. The clearest and most accurate English translation is that of N. J. Daywood, the Koran, Penguin. But Muslims tend to dislike it because Daywood was not a Muslim. The two most accurate English translations by Muslims are those by Abdullah Yusuf Ali and Muhammad Marmaduke Pickthall, both of which are available in multiple editions under various titles. Both are marred by a pseudo-King James Bible English, which makes them irritating to read. This book is continued on Disc 2.